pick up on week two with our series talking about Joseph. Now, maybe you're here and you know all there is to know about this Old Testament character named Joseph. Maybe you're here and you know nothing about this Old Testament character named Joseph. I, I hope that over the next few minutes you plug in. Uh, now, listen, I don't like to... Uh, let me, let me say it like this. You know, sometimes uh, God gives you something to say. And uh, I heard Jensen Franklin say one time that people think God faxes me these sermons. <laughs> that doesn't work. That's, that was an old sermon. He would probably say email today, but that was a long time ago. But when I, hear, when I heard Donna share some of the things that she shared, it lets me know that what, what we're going to talk about today is for you. And so here's what I want you to do just over the next little while. Uh, I, I love this phrase, just lean in. Man, you, you got stuff going on this afternoon. You got stuff going on this evening. You got a big week planned uh, starting tomorrow. I'm going to ask you to take these next few moments and just lean into what the Spirit of the Lord might say to you. Because I believe you're here on purpose. I believe you're here because you're supposed to be here. And I believe as we look at some of the stuff that Joseph went through, you're going to find a parallel in your own life. And so let's just lean in together. Can we do that? Can we just, can we just work together? Uh, because, I, you know, how many know that, that preaching is not a one-directional deal? You know, i got to be anointed to speak, but you got to be anointed to hear. And that's why we prayed today. I, I, I really sincerely from my heart pray you latch on to some of these principles today and that uh, they make a difference in your life. Here's our, here's our series text. We've read it each week. It's Acts chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, and it says, And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. If you're, you got your Bible open, those four words, God was with him, circle them, yellow highlight them, put quotation marks around them, God was with him. That's really the underlying story of the whole story of Joseph, is that it, through all that he went through, God was with him. And oh, by the way, if God was with him, then God is with, yes. God was with him and rescued him out of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. So today, if you're just one of those folks, and I hope you are, that like to follow along, we're going to be in Genesis 39. Um, the main passages will be on the screen behind me, but if you like to follow along in your own Bible, we'll be in Genesis 39. So let me give you just a quick summary about the story of Joseph. Joseph was his father's favorite son. And I can, you know, I know how that feels like. I was my, my parents' favorite, obviously. And uh, I, I say that because my sister listens to the podcast. And so, uh, but here's, here's what Joseph's problem was. He, he liked to talk about it. He liked to wear his special coat that his dad gave him. He liked to talk about the dreams that he had about all of his brothers serving him. And he liked to gloat about it just a little bit. But I mean, know that even in that, God was working out a path for Joseph. Joseph uh, was uh, just infuriated his brothers. And so if you know the story, you know what happened. They attacked him, threw him in a pit. That's kind of where we left him last week. That was probably wrong. Actually, it was two weeks ago. We left Joseph in a pit for two weeks. Uh, but that's where he was. And we talked about that pit. We said that pit refers to those times when trouble and heartache and sickness and depression or some other difficulty just seems to have you buried. Well, after Joseph gets out of the pit, what, here's what happens. They sold him into slavery, into Egypt. A man by the name of Potiphar uh, employs him to work in his house. And so here's where we're picking up Joseph is in Potiphar's house. And so let me tell you what Potiphar's house might mean to you and me today. Potiphar's house represents those times in our lives when we're in a place where we simply do not belong. Anybody? Joseph was away from his people, away from his family, in a different culture. He didn't belong there. Have you ever felt like you just didn't belong? Okay, let me ask it another way. Have you ever been in a job where you didn't belong? Okay, well, let me ask you another question. Ever, ever been in a relationship that you had no business being in? Starting to see what I'm talking about? Okay, let's, can we get just real now? Anybody ever been to a party you shouldn't have gone to? Been in a place where you shouldn't be. Sometimes because you chose to go there, sometimes just from no fault of your own, you're in a place where you don't belong. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, 
I'll tell you my story. Would you like to hear it? Yeah, I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, okay, I'm 17 years old, circa 1983. And I, I got invited to go to the Fox Theater with a group of friends of mine uh, to see a movie at the Fox Theater. And the movie was... An, it was ACDC, Let There Be Rock. Now, y'all don't know ACDC, but that was, my, that was my group there at the time. And, and uh, ACDC had this guitar player. His name was Angus Young, and he was all over the place, one of the greatest guitar players ever, I guess. And he was just crazy. And, and I, I saw a video of him not too long ago, and he was still crazy, but he was having to suck oxygen between every song because he's old. And, uh, and so here's what happened. I'm, I'm sitting in this theater, and if you're... If you're kind of unfamiliar with who ACDC was, you, you heard the, the song Highway to Hell. Yeah, they, they, that's their mantra. Uh, in fact, Bon Scott, who was their lead singer, died in a, in a pool of his own vomit hours after recording that song. So it was a real great place for a, uh, a, a new believer to find himself. Anybody ever been in the Fox Theater? Ever seen it with a purple haze across the top of the, the roof? Well, I did. It was, uh, it was just one of those nights where there was all sorts of things to get involved with in that environment that somebody that was trying to live for Christ had no business being in. It was really, you've been at a concert when you saw people lighting lighters. That's not, they weren't just showing off their lighters. There was, there was all sorts of these little orange buds floating around all night long. And, and uh, I knew that the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in that environment. He said, why are you here? I didn't have a good answer. But I leaned on to him because he, I, I don't like to over-spiritualize things. But I'm going to tell you that if I made some different choices that night, my life could have went down a completely different path. And so I'm going to tell you that we're all going to find ourselves in places where we don't belong. And how do we navigate those times? How through bad choices of our own or wrong choices of our, of our own or through the circumstances of life, we find ourselves in a place where we should not be. That's what we're going to talk about. Maybe you've prayed for the new job, but the new job hadn't come. Maybe that place that you're in, your Potiphar's house, challenges your strength. It drains you emotionally and tempts you to compromise your integrity. What do you do? I'm glad that you asked. First thing, and you might want to write this down, never underestimate the power of the presence of God. I'm going to tell you that in that environment, I, I, I'm not sure I, I, I sense the presence of God in a great, in a great way. I, I sense the presence of evil, but I heard the Lord speak. And so here's what you need to know. Your environment, the place that you're in, doesn't preclude you from the, power, the, the presence of God. In fact, just because you happen to be a in a strange place doesn't mean that God isn't with you. And listen, many of you are, are familiar with Pentecost and charismatic worship, and, and you think you've got to feel something all the time. And that's not how it works, y'all. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean that God's not there. So all too often we believe that just because we're in a difficult situation, a, a trial, a temptation, that somehow God has forsaken us. And that's not the truth, y'all. I'm learning that in reality, that nothing could be further from the truth. See, I like, I like to say it like this. Many times, God has to take you through something to get you to something. I'm learning that Sometimes these difficult places, God's taken us through them to teach us and to mold us and to shape us and to form us into the man and woman of God that he called us to be. And the thing that he has for you might be on the other side of this place where you don't belong. So don't discount God's presence even in a place where you might not feel him. So you're going to say, how do I know he's with me? How do I know I'm in God's presence by how you feel? Is that how? Because you heard his voice audibly? Is that how you know? I'm going to tell you how, you how you know. Because you've learned to trust his promise to never leave you, 
never forsake you. Let God be true and every man a liar. He's with you because he said he was going to be with you. And that should be enough. You don't need to feel him. Is it wonderful when you do? Absolutely. Is it, is it encouraging when you sense the presence of God? Absolutely. Of course it is. But you don't need that to understand that he is with you. He was with Joseph in a, in, in a, in, in a culture that he didn't understand. Away from his people. Away from his home. Away from his family. Sold into slavery. Joseph knew that God was with him. Not because his environment, not because his circumstances told him that, but because he had learned to trust God. And that if God said he's with us, then guess what? He's with us. And, and, and y'all, that's really the underlying thought of this whole story of Joseph, is that regardless of your pit, of your Potiphar's house, your palace, or your prison, uh, or your... God's with us. He's there among us. And he's with you even when you don't want to be where you're at. In fact, Genesis 39, 2 says this. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man. The Lord was with Joseph even in the middle of his difficult time. Even in the middle of his being sold into slavery, the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph. So never underestimate the power of the presence of God. You might want to write this down. Never underestimate a person touched with God's favor. Genesis 39.3 says, Now his master, now you have to understand, his master was Egyptian. The Egyptians served all kinds of gods, but not the Hebrew God, not Jehovah God. But listen to what happened to his master. Now his master saw that the Lord, capital L, was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. How many understand that when God is with you, his favor is on you, that even people who don't know God will recognize God's hand on your life? That when God is with you, and when God's favor is on you, listen, I, I want you to be loud about your faith, I do, but you don't have to stand on a street corner with a megaphone, you, you know, preaching for people to recognize that God's favor and God's presence is in your life. You know, if you walk with him and talk with him, guess what? It shows. And when God's favor's on you, people recognize it. Sometimes, so much so where they don't like you because God's hand's on your life. <laughs> Watchman Nee, uh, I, if you're a reader, you ought to read Watchman Nee. He said it this way. Good is not always God's will, but God's will is always good. So can it be that even in the midst of, this, of Joseph being separated from his family, being separated from his culture in, in a strange land, sold into slavery, could God turn that for good? The answer is yes. See, when God's hand of favor is on a man, on a woman, it shows. It's evident. Maybe you're in a place, a place you don't belong even though you really don't want to be there, maybe you're there to show people around you just how real and powerful your God is. Could God be using you in a strategic way? I hate this job. I hate this job. Well, maybe God's got you there for a reason. Maybe God's got there to show his hand of favor on you to show just how real God is. Maybe you'd say, I work in the most godless environment you can imagine. Man, maybe that's why you're there. To show the presence and power of God and his favor on the life of a human being. Maybe you're there. Not to, you know, hit somebody on the head with a 47-pound reference Bible. But to just love Jesus and love people and let God's hand of favor be, be evident in your own life. And maybe you can bring God into a godless environment. Perhaps your Potiphar's house is a place of temptation. What do you do then? I get it. Here's what happened to Joseph. See, Potiphar's wife had the hots for him. Is that still a thing? Can I still say that and you know what it means? See, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know the hip 
vernacular. Is hip still a thing? Can I still say that? Potiphar's wife thought he was good looking. So let me just, I, I just want to read this. This straight out of God's word. Uh, it's not going to be on the screen behind me. It's not in your bulletin. You just, just listen. <clears throat> From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Pot Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about the thing except uh, worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. How many would like to not worry about nothing about what you're going to have for lunch? Come on, somebody. The Bible says Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. She kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. How many know temptation just doesn't go away? Is that just me or is it everybody? Temptation, if it hits you on Monday, it's probably going to hit you on Tuesday. Okay, day after day. I just want to make sure I was in the right room. Day after day. But he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. He's avoiding her. Which, oh, by the way, that's a pretty good strategy, isn't it? All right. One day, however, no one else was around when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come on, sleep with me, Joseph, tore himself away and he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. He's a person of integrity, right? This is where it got him. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and that he had fled, she called out to her servants. Some, soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband had brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to try to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away but he left his cloak here behind me. Um, write this down. Never underestimate a person of integrity. D did you hear what he said? He said, there is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you're his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? Don't you... Don't you understand? Don't, we recognize that we live in a world and in a culture where integrity is fleeting. So I'll tell you two stories and we'll, we'll contrast them together. Uh, if you're a tennis fan, the name Andy Roddick is not unfamiliar to you. In fact, if you're not a tennis fan, the name Andy Roddick is probably familiar. He's one of the greatest tennis players that's ever played the game. And, and until he retired, he was ranked the number one player in the world for years and years and years and years and years. He was an awesome tennis player. He's in a tournament with, in, in 2005, and I, I had to write this guy's name down. I know I'd forget it. Fernando Verdasco, who was, uh, Andy Roddick was the number one seed in this tournament. tournament. Verdasco was way down. Andy Roddick was supposed to wipe up the, the court with this guy. Well, sure enough, Andy Roddick dominates the match and is facing triple match point. In other words, if he wins one out of the next three points, the match is over and Andy Roddick wins. Verdasco's serving, first service is out, second service is called out, and so Verdasco approaches the net to shake Andy Roddick's hand and, con and congratulations, Andy Roddick doesn't walk to the net, but walks to the judge's table, or stand. Because Andy Roddick knows something that nobody else knows. Andy Roddick knows something the judge doesn't know, and that Verdasco doesn't know, that the crowd doesn't know, is that the serve was actually in. How many know that in tennis, on the line is in? Well, Andy Roddick saw the ball hit the line, and walks to the, the judge and says, um, you, you got to reverse that call. The, the serve was in. And, and in fact, Andy Roddick offered to show the, the judge the, the mark. It was, it was on a clay court. He said, I'll show you the mark. And so the judge reversed the call. Well, spurred on by this 
unthinkable, uh, let me just say it like this, very few, very few people are going to do that. Would you agree with that? Very few people are going to be that honest. Well, Verdasco comes back and wins the game, wins the set, and then goes on to win the match. That choice cost Andy Roddick literally tens of thousands of dollars. So let's contrast that with something maybe a little bit, that was 2005. Let's, let's talk about something that's happened oh, very recently. Any baseball fans in the house? You already know who I'm talking about. Uh, the, the Houston Astros recently got their hand caught in the cookie jar. We don't have time to tell you the whole story, but let's just, they got caught using video and, and highly technical devices to steal the signs from the opposing catcher. And they were using signals inside the dugout to let the batter know what pitch was coming. Um, there's a word for that. Cheating. So what's the difference between what the Houston Astros were doing and what Andy was doing? See, we're first name basis. Andy's a believer. And he wasn't going to receive something that wasn't rightfully his. Houston Astros are cheaters. And I want to tell you what's going to happen. Write this down. There are going to be more Astros hit by pitch this year than ever in the history of the game. <laughs> I'm not wrong. So, I, I, I just want to lay this out by saying this. You, you don't have a blank for this, but you ought to write this down. God's people should be people of integrity. We ought to be people who do what we say we're going to do. I got on this, <laughs> I got on this YouTube trail this past week. Is anybody else do that? You look for something on YouTube or on the internet, and then it leads you down a path, and you're like... Why am I watching the story of Jim and Tammy Baker? <laughs> but I landed there. And I'm watching the story of Jim and Tammy Baker. And I saw, and I started reading the comments. Christianity's just a farce. God's not real. All they wanted was their money. See, I'm going to tell you, when, when Christians prove themselves to be people outside of integrity... It, it, it doesn't just make you look bad. It makes the church look bad. In reality, it makes God look bad. So I'm going to tell you that you and I need to be people of integrity. Does that mean we're perfect people? No. There's, there's two perfect people, Jesus and my wife. <laughs> and, and what is that, y'all? Come on, somebody. But we ought to be people who strive to live lives of integrity. We ought to be people who strive to live lives of integrity. We ought to be people who do what we say that we would do. And we can't gloss over the kind of integrity that Joseph was displaying there. In this encounter with Potiphar's wife, so we're going to talk for just a moment about sexual integrity inside the body of Christ. Because it's a thing. Am I wrong? No. See, see, God created the sexual union and declared it was good. Can I get an amen, somebody? <laughs> when it's done his way. And before I go any further, if, if, if we get into what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes and, and, and you, feel, you feel some condemnation because of something that happened in your past, I want, to, I want to stop you right now. Listen to me. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So don't you let the enemy beat you up about something that happened a long time ago or last week if it's under the blood. Ooh, can we, are we still okay saying words like under the blood? Is that all right? If, if, if it's been forgiven and washed away, it doesn't exist anymore. So don't let the enemy jump some, th throw some condemnation on you that God has already taken away. We good there? All right. God declared it good when it's done his way. And let me tell you what his way is, with, in no uncertain terms. His way is one man, one woman, 
in a monogamous marital relationship. Period. Sexual activity inside those parameters is beautiful and good and wonderful. Sexual activity outside those parameters is destructive. I, I tell you how I, I, I explained this to my boys. They're going to love this because they're both in the room. <laughs> but we point to a fireplace. And the fire burning in the fireplace, is, is it not just wonderful? Anybody love a fireplace? And, 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 and let, me, let me just paint this picture for you. Fire in a fireplace, fuzzy britches, my fuzzy Crocs, hot coffee. Isn't that awesome? Fire in a fireplace. Put that exact same fire in the middle of the living room. It's destructive and deadly. So what, what I want you to hear from me today is that God has a plan for each of us to display sexual integrity because it matters. It matters. Listen, sexual intimacy inside that kind of relationship is beautiful and outside it is destructive and some of you have testimonies of that fact. I know I won't go hear any amens there, but, I, but you do. Because here's what I'm learning is that the enemy has a counterfeit for the things God created as good and healthy. So I'm, I'm just going to take my halo off, so I want you to take yours off. Sexual temptation, even in a Christian's life, is real. See, I knew, I, I knew then, I, again. It's real. And, oh, let me stop you. It's everywhere. I was riding down the road not too long ago with a brother, and, and we, we began to talk about our marriages and how God has blessed our marriages. And then, and then this subject came up. You know, there is no shortage of ways for the enemy to destroy your marriage. And it's true. I remember as when I was raising my children, um, we had a rule that the Internet-capable computer was in the living room where everybody could see, right? I mean, no, that don't work anymore. You carry with you everywhere you go, right? Sexual temptation is very, very real. And maybe, maybe you're in a place where you're single and waiting. I'm going to tell you God's grace is big enough when you do things his way. Maybe you're in a marriage where you and your spouse have seemingly lost all aspects of marital intimacy. How I many of God's in the restoration business, yeah? And oh, by the way, how, when, did, when did marital intimacy always equal sex? You need, if if y'all come to Mary Not Live, you'd, you'd hear us talk about that. There's a, there's a shameless little plug, right? Maybe, maybe you just... You just found it so easy because the computer always says yes. L listen, y'all. We got to get a handle on this. Not, not just at life point, but a as the, the body of Christ. Because I'm going to tell you that uh, for some reason, we've glossed over this issue and said that, well, it... it it, it really doesn't matter. It's really not that big a deal. What two adults do in private, I get all that. But it's not God's plan, y'all. It's not. And I'm not going to, listen, y'all can be mad at me if you want to, but one day I'm going to stand before God, and I'm going to tell you that God's plan is one, mar one man, one woman, in a monogamous marital relationship, period. Anything outside of that is destructive. You said, well, this sure doesn't feel good. Sin's pleasurable for a season. I can hear you now. Oh, but my heart. I'm going to let you in a little secret. Your heart will lie to you. Your heart will cause you to wind up right in the middle of a bad situation, in the matter of a bad relationship. In the, now, now listen. Stop, stop. Now listen. Some of you got testimonies of how God took a poor decision and turned it around and redeemed it. 
And listen, he's big enough to do just that. Right? All right. But my heart. (laughs) Write this down. The human heart is naturally deceptive. Your heart will lie to you. In fact, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's tough, isn't it? That's hard. But it's true. Your heart will lie to you. Your heart will tell you that God's plan is not the best plan. That that might be true for everybody else, but I'm, you, don't know, you don't understand my relationship. You don't understand my marriage. You don't understand how lonely I feel. You don't understand. And I'm going to tell you your heart is lying to you. That God has a good plan. It's the best plan, and it's for you. Listen, you can't be at Life Point very long without you hearing me say something like this. You can't follow your feelings. Listen, I I don't want you to do that in in a worship service. You know, I I grew up in an environment where if somebody wasn't laying out on the floor at the end of church, then, then God didn't show up. You with me? Your your feelings. I'm I'm going to tell you that that while those times are wonderful when God's presence is moving mightily that he didn't have I don't have to feel him to know he's among us he's among us because he said he would be okay so just like I don't want you following your feelings that way I don't want you following your feelings in a relationship that you probably don't have any business being in to begin with Matthew chapter 15, Jesus said, this is what your heart will do to you. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart, listen, this is encouraging, comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. That's what your heart's capable of. Aren't you glad you came to church today? That's what your heart's capable of. So you know what you need? Need a new heart. So how do I get a new heart? I get a new heart because I, I try harder. No. How many have been down that road and, and, and failed miserably? Me too. You, you get a new heart by, by, by making sure you come to church and pay your tithes and go to growth group and do all that thing. Is that, is that how you get a new heart? Maybe it points you in the right direction. One way you get a new heart. A new heart is a direct result of an encounter with God. And if if temptation comes every day, guess what I need every day? An encounter with God. Some of you guys know David's story, King David's story. I saw his tomb. It was kind of cool. That sounded bad. I saw his tomb. It was cool. No, that's, that's not right. It was, I, I saw his, uh, his tomb. I, I, I was in his man cave. That was kind of cool. Mine's better, but still. <laughs> Some of you know David's story. They took us to a spot where they believed David was standing when he looked over Jerusalem and looked over to some of the houses and saw this woman, Bathsheba, bathing on her rooftop. And he called for her. Long story short is, I'm I'm going to read something in that story for you, by the way. Um, I got a funny feeling that wasn't David's first time on the rooftop. I got a a feeling that probably wasn't the first time he saw Bathsheba. Because he knew what time to go up there. I, I mean, know that repetition and habit and... It'll, it'll get you somewhere where you don't need to go. So anyway, so David sees Bathsheba, calls for her. They have, uh, you know, they <laughs> do the thing, and, and uh, she gets pregnant. And long, long story short, he winds up uh, calling for her husband to try to conceal the fact that David had conceived a child with his wife. That doesn't work. So David commits murder, has her husband Uriah the Hittite murdered. 
And then the, the, there's a, David had a, a preacher in his life, and it was Nathan. And Nathan called him out on his sin and said, David, you have sinned. So David realized what he'd done. And he, and he pens these words. In Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What a prayer. And what if tomorrow morning, in the, in the face of, uh, of compromise of our sexual integrity, or any kind of integrity. Listen, we, we talked about sexual integrity a little bit, but how many know that this world wants you to lie, cheat, and steal? You know, we, we're coming up on tax day. We all got an opportunity to fudge the numbers, don't we? But how many know God's calling us to a place of integrity? So what if, what if on Monday morning we pray that prayer? God created me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. What if Tuesday created me a clean heart, oh God? Renew a right spirit within me. Because isn't it funny? How sometimes the filth of the world jumps on your heart. See, sometimes we, we, we talk like this and you think, well, I'm saved and so I'm, I, I'm good. I, maybe you found a secret I hadn't found, but I got to pray that prayer a lot. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. See, I, I, I believe that if we're going to live the kind of life that God's called us to live, listen, Nobody in this room is perfect. And we're going to fail. And we're going to fall short of God's glorious standard. Man, I, I, want, I want the hand of God to be on my life. I want the favor of God to be on my life so other people who don't know God can come to know Him because they've seen His favor on my life. And let me tell you when that happens. It's when I live the kind of life that's outlined in that book. That's when I, I, I am who I say I am. That's when I walk with integrity and authenticity. When I'm, I'm, I'm a genuine follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what that means? That means sometimes I'm going to fail. But when I fail on Monday, here's what I'm going to pray Tuesday morning. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me, O oh God. Listen, I... I'm, I honor Joseph for <laughs> running in the face of temptation. So we're going to talk about three things that we're going to take away from Potiphar's house. Three things. Please, man, man, if you hadn't heard any of the uh, other stuff, please gr grab these three things. Number one, the enemy can't take you to a place where the presence of God can't keep you. The enemy can't take you to a place where the presence of God can't keep you. I, I heard somebody say it this way, that, that the enemy can't take you somewhere where God won't protect you. And I don't know that that's always true. I, I, I've seen stories of missionaries giving their life for the cause of Christ, but it wasn't because they weren't kept. You with me? You might have to walk into some dangerous places. I lost you there, didn't I? I'm going to tell you that we live in a world where we have this, my view of, of our lives has been jaded recently. We love the idea of our, of our suburban, safe, 2.3 kids, Two cars in the driveway. Life. How I many know most Christians don't live that kind of life? You know there's more Christians outside the United States than there are inside the United States. But it doesn't matter where, where God might ask you to go. Mikey's got some friends that have been serving in China. They've been bouncing all over the world because of, of this coronavirus that they're facing. And, and, and I, I told you a story about my, my, my uncle who's a Baptist missionary who you know, went to Costa Rica and then the Panama Canal Zone, woke up with 18 feet anaconda in his bedroom. I'm going to tell you that 
That everywhere you go may not be safe. Everything God asks you to do not, might not be safe. We've been on mission trips where, that weren't safe. When we went to Israel a couple weeks ago, there were some places that weren't safe. I didn't tell my wife that, but there was no, they, they weren't safe. But you can't outrun the presence of God. And if you're where you're supposed to be, man, where else do you want to be? Yeah, does that make sense, y'all? I, I, wanna, I would rather be in a dangerous place inside of God's will than a safe place outside of it. Maybe that's how I need to say it. All right. So the enemy can't take you to a place where the presence of God can't keep you. Write this down. Here's our second takeaway. That God's favor can turn your problem into a promotion. See, we, we read Joseph's story. He was sold into slavery, and he's, he's a servant in this house. And, and if you hang on with me for a couple more weeks, you're going to see how it really turns into a promotion. And I guess I wanted you to have this part here because we get so impatient when things aren't going our way. We get so impatient when we don't have the job we want, when we don't have the house we want, we don't have the car we want, we don't have all of those things. You, get, you understand what I'm saying? Anybody else impatient? I just need to know. Anybody else impatient? Me too, yes. But how many know that God can take a bad situation? God can take a Potiphar's house and turn it into something for your good. He does. He does it all the time. I'll never forget. I've told you all my, all my stories. I, you know, I, I remember after Donna and I lost our second child. I, I, I remember asking God, what, what good can come from this? It, this kind of pain, this kind of heartache. Do you know I've had an opportunity many, many times to talk to men who, whose wife had a miscarriage and say, man, I, I know, I know. I know. And then Mikey and Matthew show up. And, and I just look at our family and I go, this was the way it was supposed to be. God knew what he was doing. It's a little easier to see that in the rearview mirror, isn't it? But if, when you're in the middle of it, it stings. So just remember this. And we can't take you someplace where the presence of God can't keep you. And that God may be using this situation to turn for your good. To take your problem, turn it into a promotion. And then lastly, don't follow your heart. Follow God's heart. I'm going to let you know a little secret. And this is going to come as a great surprise to many of you. God's a lot smarter than you. The Bible says, Psalm 139 says that he recorded every day of your life before you breathed your first breath. So not only does he know about your bad choice, not only does he know about this Potiphar's house experience that you're in, he knows what's on the other side of it. So let's do this. Instead of following Dwayne's emotions and the way Dwayne feels and the way Dwayne's heart is leading him, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to listen to God and do what he says. I'm going to follow God's heart. And, and listen, there's, there's, only, there's only one way you can do that. Donna, come. Play. There's really only one way you can do that. You have to know his heart. You can't follow a map that, that you don't possess, right? How do I know his heart? I was 14 years old. My grandmother pointed to a picture on her wall. And it was, it was one of these cheesy three-dimensional pictures from the 70s. You remember those? Like when you, when you move, the picture seemed to move with you. Really cheesy looking. It was really, but it was this picture of Jesus knocking at a door. I was like, Mama, like, what's that about? And she said, that's Jesus knocking at your heart. 
And I, I was like, you know, at, at eight, you don't understand that, right? What, what, do you, what do you mean? She said, Dwayne, Jesus wants to live in your heart. But look at that picture very carefully. I said, okay, it's a door. She said, but there's something unique about that door. I said, I'm listening. She said, there's no doorknob on the outside. You've got to open that door and let him in. I've never forgotten that. And so the, the first way I, I know God's heart is to allow him to live in mine. And so if you're here and, and you've never made that choice to open the door of your heart that can only be opened from the inside. Somebody said that Jesus was a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in. And here's what I would ask you to do is don't, don't leave this room before you just say, Christ, I open the door of my heart. Would you live in my heart? Would you forgive me of my sin? I believe that you're the son of God. Would you live in my heart? You see, that's, that's really the most important part of this process because I, I can't know God's heart intellectually. I can only know God's heart when he lives in me. And his spirit fills my life and leads and guides and directs me. So, man, if you're here and, and you haven't made that choice, man, today is, would be a great day when we pray for you to just to pray a prayer or something like this. And I'm not going to get you to recite it because you're everybody's adult in the room. And here's the concept. Christ, I believe you are who you said you are. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me. Live in my heart. I trust you today. See, Jesus gave his life so you could, you could know God and you, he could live in your heart. And then if you're here and you say, Dwayne, I, I know that I'm saved, but I'm, I'm in a bit of a Potiphar's house. Maybe you're in, a, in an environment that seems godless. Maybe you're in a, in a place that's tempting your integrity. Maybe you're in a place where you just don't fit in and it's just uncomfortable. Whatever your Potiphar's house looks like. Man, you, I, please hear my heart when I say this. I don't want you to pray for an escape from the job you don't want. I want you to pray this way. God, use me in the middle of this situation to bring glory to you. Put your favor on my life so others can see it. Maybe you're in the middle of a tempting situation. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Maybe you need to pray that prayer 30 times a day. Guess what? It's okay. So I want you to bow your heads with me. Just, just so I know who I'm praying for. You want Christ to come and live in your heart. You want to, you want to become a Christ follower today. I just want you to just lift your hand up so I can see who I'm praying for. Amen. Amen. I saw your hands. When we pray, you're going to pray and ask the Lord to come into your heart. You're going to ask him to forgive your sins. You're going to confess that he is, in fact, the Son of God. Now, how many are here, just so I know who I'm praying for? I'm in Potiphar's house, and, and, and I need God's favor on my life in a brand new way. Put your hand in the air. Just so I, amen, 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 amen. And here's how I'm going to pray for all of you. That the favor of God rests on you. That he draws you into a place where you're walking with him and talking with him in a, in a way that maybe you never have. And that when you leave this room, the favor of God rests on you. And he causes you to be successful in whatever you try to do. And that people around you see the evidence of an almighty God at work in your life. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for those that are committing their life to Christ this morning. For those that are saying, God, forgive me of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me in your blood. God, I pray that you, you, you begin a brand new life in them today. In Jesus' name. And that God, most of all, God, that your spirit lives in their heart. And they can learn to follow your heart and not trust their own. 
God, there's so many of us in this, in this place today that we, we're in, in Potiphar's house. We're in a place we don't feel like we belong. We're in a place where our, our, our integrity is being challenged and tempted. God, help us. Help us, oh God, to be men and women of integrity, to be men and women of God, to stand when everyone else is falling. And God, I pray for everyone in this room today that as we leave this place and begin a new week, God, that your favor would rest on them. God, that the, the presence and power of God that's on your life would, would overflow to, so others around you would recognize that God's doing a work in your life. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you don't slip and fall. It just means that God's hand's on your life, and if his hand's on your life, then others are going to recognize it. Most of all, Lord, we just pause and we thank you that we have the ability to get a brand new heart. Not because we're good, not because we're clean, not because we're holy, but because the only one that is good, the only one that is clean, the only one that is holy, suffered, bled, and died for our sin. And today, we rejoice in his forgiveness and favor and blessing. We love you, Jesus. I want you to offer the Lord an ovation of praise this morning. Thank you, Lord.